optimal minimal. At this altitude, I can run flat out for a half mile before my hands start shaking. Can I answer your personal question? Now we're just in a perfect time. What if I did the opposite? I'm a cybernetic organism, living tissue over a metal endoskeleton. This episode is brought to you by Four Sigmatic. If you're a longtime listener of the show or brand new to the podcast, my favorite Finnish entrepreneurs who founded this company, of course, I don't know that many Finnish entrepreneurs, but they may be my favorites, have something new that I've been loving. And some of you are familiar with Four Sigmatic. I've used their products for years now. They were introduced to me by an acrobat of all folks, and they tend to mix different types of medicinal mushrooms into their products. I have recently started using their matcha, which is a green tea, which is designed as a coffee alternative. And if you're trying to cut back on caffeine, as I am these days, the matcha is a great option. And one that I originally learned to love in Japan has a very smooth texture to it. Their matcha blend, in particular, includes the amino acid L-theanine, which helps to provide a, let's call it, balanced boost of energy without the jitters. It also includes the adaptogen astralagus, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, which may help with overall stress tolerance. And for those of you who are wondering, no, the products don't taste like mushrooms. <laughs> if they say mushroom coffee, for instance, another product that I use doesn't taste like mushrooms, it tastes like coffee. But you get the nutritional benefits of some of these special ingredients. So the products don't taste like mushrooms and are enjoyable. I offer them to my house guests and use them myself, and I don't particularly want to drink anything that tastes like mushrooms. So moving on, the folks at Four Sigmatic have designed a few special deals for you guys, my listeners, which include many of my favorite products of theirs. So check it out. Visit Four Sigmatic, F-O-U-R-S-I-G-M-A-T-I-C.com forward slash Tim Tim. That's T-I-M-T-I-M, no space, to see these special deals, which are not offered anywhere else. Remember to use the code Tim Tim. I don't know why they chose Tim Tim, but there we go. Remember to use the code Tim Tim at checkout to receive your special discount. Again, that's foursigmatic.com forward slash Tim Tim and enter the promo code Tim Tim. Check it out. This episode is brought to you by WordPress.com. I love WordPress. I have used it for so many years. It's my go-to platform for blogging and creating websites. I use WordPress.com for everything every day. My site, Tim.blog, is built on it. The websites for my books, including Tools of Titans, Tribe of Mentors, it's all on WordPress.com. And the founder, Matt Mullenweg, one of my close friends, has appeared on this show many times. Just search Matt Mullenweg Tequila Ferris for quite an exciting time. Whether you're looking to create a personal blog, a business site, or both, you can make a really big impact right out of the box when you build on WordPress.com. And you'll be in good company. It's used by The New Yorker, Jay-Z, Beyonce, 538, TechCrunch, TED, CNN, and Time, just to name a handful. And one of my friends at Google, who shall remain nameless, has told me that WordPress.com offers the, quote, best out-of-the-box SEO imaginable, end quote. And it's one of the many reasons that nearly 30% of the internet is run on WordPress. You do not need experience or to hire someone. That's perhaps the best part. WordPress.com guides you through the entire experience. They have hundreds of designs and templates that you can use. And it's easy to get started. There's no need to worry about security, upgrades, hosting, any of that. They offer 24-7 support. And they're very, very responsive. If you have questions, they get right back to you. And this allows you to create the highest quality with the least amount of headache and friction. So if you're building a website, period, when my friends come to me and ask what I use, what I recommend they use, the answer is WordPress.com. So check it out. If you want to get started today, learn more with a 15% discount off any new plan. Go to WordPress.com forward slash Tim to create your website and find the plan that's right for you. So learn more. Take a look. WordPress.com forward slash Tim for 15% off a brand new website. Check it out. Hello, my pretty little magwai. This is Tim Ferriss, and welcome to another episode of The Tim Ferriss Show, where it is my job to deconstruct world-class performers, to tease out the habits, routines, life lessons, favorite books, and so on that you can use. And this episode, we have a true polymath. 
Joseph Gordon Levitt on Twitter and Instagram at hit record Joe, like hit record on a video camera, hit record Joe. And his site is hitrecord.org. Joe is an actor whose career spans three decades and ranges from television, i.e. Third Rock from the Sun, or I should say EG, to Art House, Mysterious Skin, Brick, to Multiplex, like Inception, 500 Days of Summer, Snowden. He made his feature screenwriting and directorial debut with Don John, which had an Independent Spirit Award nomination for Best First Screenplay. He also founded and directs Hit Record an online community of artists, around 600,000 now, emphasizing collaboration over self-promotion. Hit Record has evolved into a community-sourced production company that publishes books, puts out records, produces videos for brands from LG to the ACLU, and has won an Emmy for its variety show Hit Record on TV. So without further ado, please enjoy this wide-ranging conversation with Joseph Gordon-Levitt. Joe, welcome to the show. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me. Of course. It, uh, it's been a while since we last caught up, and I have so many questions, and now I get to ask them in a public forum. So thank you for taking the time. Oh, man. Well, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm really excited to, to be on your show. It's, um, I'm, I'm a listener, long-time listener, first-time caller, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm flattered to be in the company of, of the people that you talk to on this show, man. It's, it's really cool. Thank you. Of course, it's uh, it's completely my pleasure, and I thought we might start. And of course, where I where I start is not going to be where we go, since the the format of my shows is generally closest to the movie Memento, as I mentioned before we got started. Mm-hmm. But I reached out to, as I often like to do with guests, a mutual friend to ask a question that I very frequently ask, which is, and I'll, I'll tell you the text that I sent and you'll be able to guess who this is. Okay. I'm curious. Partially because I'm going to say the name. Evan, <laughs> exclamation point. Been, uh, yeah. <laughs> been ages, man. Hope you're great. <laughs> you know, I'm finally interviewing Joe and we've had a few chats and one dinner in the last year. Might you be able to suggest any particular topics, questions, or stories that could be fun or interesting to explore? Does his answer involve balls? <laughs> it doesn't, but now we have to talk about balls. So <laughs> balls goes on the list for sure. How could it not? And he gave me a number of different thoughts and recommendations. And then he added like 20 minutes later, and he can breathe fire if you tickle his feet. Have fun. So I wanted to, <laughs> I wanted to fact check that first because knowing Evan, I'm suspect. Uh, so true or false, can you breathe fire if I tickle your feet? <clears throat> um, that depends on your state of mind. <laughs> But, uh, that's 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 Evan Goldberg, by the way, for those wondering who who Evan is. Could you explain for people who are like, who the hell is Evan? Who who is Evan, and how did you first meet? Yeah, uh, Evan Goldberg is um, known for being writing partners with Seth Rogen, uh, and Seth and Evan are like the the comedy pair, and they started by writing Super Bad together, and they wrote it about themselves. In fact, the character names of Super Bad, if you go back and watch it again, are Seth and Evan, and uh, <laughs> I think I think Michael Sarah is playing Evan, right, and and Jonah Hill is playing Seth, if I'm not mistaken, um, which is wildly inaccurate to who they are, <laughs> um, but uh, but funny anyway. And, um, yeah, they're, they're just two really hilarious guys. We did two movies together. The first one was 50, 50. And then, uh, the second one was called the night before. And, um, he, they're really, really smart dudes. Um, which is funny because they make, um, they make humor that, um, probably doesn't get regarded as smart, but as with many things in, uh, in movies, I find oftentimes the stuff that, um, is considered lowbrow or sort of mainstream or pop is often the most, um, intelligently constructed, um, which applies to them sometimes and (laughs) not other times. Yeah. They're very, very, very smart guys. Uh, and just to paint a picture for folks, uh, Evan always wears shorts uh, he does all his meetings standing up just about, which can cause some anxiety if you don't know why he's standing and don't realize that's what he always does. Or he'll be in like a deep squat, like an Olympic weightlifter, which is whole so separate he, says, he always says, uh, sitting is the new smoking. <laughs> right. Right. And, uh, pro tip for anyone who might bump into these, these folks, 
if you sit down with them and they're brainstorming, I would advise you not to smoke with them unless you consider yourself <laughs> a really good smoker. A really, really <laughs> strong smoker. I've had uh, that experience on both sides because <laughs> I've been working with them in phases of my life where I was smoking a lot and phases of my life where I was not smoking a lot. And <laughs> the first time I met them, um, well, it wasn't the first time we met, but with the first time we really hung out, um, uh, they were asking me to do their movie, um, 50, 50. And, uh, I flew up to Vancouver where they were. Um, <laughs> time was short for reasons that don't really matter for the story. Um, uh, and they had to cast this role really quickly as happens all the time in show business. And, um, so I, I read the script and that night flew up to Vancouver to sit down with Seth and Evan and John Levine, who was directing the movie. And uh, we had a good talk about the movie and talked about the things that one normally talks about. And then we sort of got to a point where that part of the meeting, you know, came to a natural conclusion, at which point Seth pulled out a joint and we went up to the roof and smoked and then had kind of what felt like the real meeting, <laughs> even though it was... <laughs> was not <laughs> it's like meeting with chinese bureaucrats except they're not chinese and you're using a different substance right? <laughs> is that how it goes well they'll bring out something called baijiu which is this horrifically strong and unpleasant alcohol and that's that's when the real meeting starts <laughs> oh wow yeah. yeah see to me smoking weed and strong alcohol could not be two experiences that are more different right. from each other <laughs> um, that's not everyone's experience. And that's, I mean, look, everyone has their, you know, their own, I think, reaction to different substances. And I'm not one of those weed smokers that encourages people to smoke weed. Cause I do think it's different for everyone. But for me, um, at least at certain times in my life, uh, it's, it's not brain killing. It's quite the opposite. You, my, my brain would kind of leap places that it, it might not otherwise. <laughs> And those guys, well, I should, I should mention a few things for folks. So number one, if you're going to BC, like you're going into the dragon's den of high potency plant matter. So you really true, need true. to have your wits about you. Second, for those people, we won't spend too much time on this, but who are interested in what master sommeliers of pot, i.e. Evan and Seth, would recommend like the the pot that they use for creative work, the pot that they use for functions A, B, C, D, and E. We do talk about it in the podcast that I did with the two of those guys. So we, yeah, I'm not you, surprised. You, you, you can check it out. The reason I brought them up, aside from the the bullets and then the balls that I've put on to my list now that we will oh, get to. Oh, that's just because you know they they get paid lots of money to make jokes about balls. Ah, and, yes. But he 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 uh he surmounted my expectation. <laughs> he exceeded my expectations by um making the fire breathing joke that was much more tasteful than a joke about my balls <laughs> the first thing you said wasn't a joke at all and you alluded to it just a moment ago that i wanted to ask you about first thing he said and so i've i've known evan for a while we've had plenty of exchanges so the very first thing he says is he's awesome he saved our movie 50 50 and i'm gonna oh, yeah. ed, i'm gonna edit what he said slightly afterwards but he said you know, such and such person was cast and he had to drop out and Joe replaced him in 24 hours, which is all the time we had before they shut us down. And I forever love him for it. So why did you choose to do that movie? Um, <clears throat> yeah, well, I mean, I should say I'm, I, the person who had to drop out, it was, um, you know, it was a, a family emergency. So there was no bad blood between anybody. Mm -hmm. um, but uh yeah. Why do I choose? I mean, it's, it's a, it's a larger question that I think applies here the same as really any movie. Um, and why choose any given movie? I mean, the first thing to say is I'm incredibly lucky to get to choose mm -hmm. what role I do or don't take. And it wasn't always that way for many, many years. I started acting when I was six and, uh, for, like a long, long time, uh, up until actually pretty much just a few years ago. Uh, well, it's more than a few now, isn't it? I'm getting old, but, uh, <laughs> I, I would just audition and, and take the, the part that if I got a part, then that was great news. And I would do the part that I got. 
I would win on lots of auditions. And, and so I, I come from the, the mentality of it's amazing to get a role. Um, however, um, in recent years when I've been fortunate enough to be able to kind of pick what I do and don't do, it's sort of, uh, the only power you have as an actor in a way is the power to say no, hmm. because once, once you say yes, movies really aren't the actor's medium and that's really cool and can also be frustrating depending on the context. Um, if you're working with a director and other filmmakers who you're on the same page with, it can be incredible to have them there, you know, sort of bringing forth and, and, uh, um, kind of refining and presenting the, the work that you do. Um, but if you're not on the same page with somebody, it can be really frustrating because y you can try all you want to make the performance what you think it should be. But, uh, you know, uh, ultimately it's going to be up to the director because what I think often gets, uh, overlooked or underemphasized is just how big a role all the other factors are when you, you think you're watching an actor give a performance and you are watching that actor but you're also watching the work of the editor and, you know, the camera crew. You're listening to the work of the musicians and all, you know, productions, all these other factors that all contribute to the feeling that you get when you watch a performance. And, um, and so what makes me say yes is when I feel good and on the same page with mostly the director um, because it's should be the director's job to kind of be steering the whole entire ship with all of those elements in the same direction. Um, it's not always just the director. Sometimes like in the case of 50, 50 with Seth and Evan, there's John Levine, who is very much the director, but also Seth and Evan who are producing <clears throat> are, you know, big parts of the collaborative process. And they're, they're very collaborative in general. And that was one of the things I liked about, um, their situation that they create is, uh, they, they really let the actors in and it's a very collaborative thing and you can feel like you trust them. They're not, uh, they're not going to tell you they want one thing and be doing something else or try to trick you into anything. And, you know, that whole, there's, there's a phrase sometimes that gets said, people will say to a director, Oh, you really got a great performance out of that actor. And, um, I was, feel like, uh, that's not really how I would put it, <laughs> you know, uh, it's, and some directors do sort of try to take the proactive role and be like, it's up to me to get this performance out of you. And, um, so I'm going to use my manipulation or whatever it takes to like f force you into feeling what I need you to feel right now, which to me feels, um, adversarial and in my experience doesn't usually work as well as sort of let's all be on the same team and I'm going to, you know, where the director is supporting the actor to, uh, help the actor do what they need to do. Um, and then presenting all and making sure all the other elements are on the same page so that it all comes together in a, in a cohesive way and, and the audience can feel it. It's, you mentioned directing and as someone who's never been involved with film, uh, although I've been involved with some, unscripted television, which is a totally different animal. Less uh, different than you might think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I suppose that's true. A lot of unscripted television is exactly scripted, let's be clear. <laughs> uh, yeah. And just for people at home who are who might watch some reality TV, yeah, if you ever see a lot of people standing in a kitchen and there's someone mixing a random thing in a bowl, like they're not actually <laughs> mixing anything. And why are they all standing in the kitchen? Because there's natural light. Like no one in real life does that. So that was planned. Uh, but the the... the yeah, I think the difference between unscripted and scripted is uh, if you call the writers producers, you don't have to pay them as much. <laughs> <laughs> so I read somewhere that you've talked about the ability to balance a thorough plan with spontaneity being the crux or at the crux of being a good director. And I don't want to misquote you, uh, but... Uh, that's, I, I think that's true. 
So I'd love to hear, since you have worn many hats, you are not just an actor, you've done many other things, uh, could you tell us maybe a story or give an example of directors you've worked well with and things they've done to help you or to help the entire movie uh, move well? Uh, just if there are any particular stories and just what comes to mind for me as someone who really doesn't know much about this at all is I remember someone telling me at one point that uh, instead of saying action Clint Eastwood would say or maybe still says uh, whenever you're ready <laughs> that was his lead in not to say that makes a big difference but there there are uh, very and then Robert Rodriguez living now in Austin Texas as I do I've gotten to know and he'll play music in between takes he'll actually hire artists to uh, help people learn how to paint while they're on set as a way of. I did some painting diff- on Rodriguez's set. Yeah. Oh, that cool. That's right. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And uh, so I'd be curious to know what directors you've worked with uh, have have done from uh, from that perspective to to help things that you've you've found memorable, and then also what you've done when when directing other people. Uh, and and how you how you've forged your own style as director? Sure. Um, let's see. Well, the first feature film I was ever in was a movie called A River Runs Through It, mm-hmm. which was directed by Robert Redford, uh, uh, who's a great actor turned director. And uh, I was ten, and I remember. This is one of my favorite stories. Uh, it, it, um, we were doing a scene where I had to walk up to my dad at his desk and sort of show him something I had written. And, uh, and we did a few takes and I wasn't hitting my mark. A mark is a little piece of tape that they put down on the floor. Um, so that when you walk into a room, you hit that mark and that mark is important for you to hit because they've set up the camera, they've set up all the lights to all look good for the actor to stand in that exact position. And if the actor is standing in a different position, well, it'll look different. Um, and by the way, the cinematographer for a river runs through it, uh, won an Oscar for, for this movie. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> And he, the the DP, director of photography, which is the same as cinematographer, uh, uh, he walked up to me after the second time or whatever that I missed my mark and and very nicely uh, asked me to, you know, make sure that I stood on the mark, stood where that green piece of tape was on the floor. And I was uh, nervous. (laughs) I, 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 I was 10. (laughs) <laughs> and I'd, I'd been on plenty of sets before. Uh, I'd been working, uh, I think I said, since I was six. But um, but it, no matter who you are, how long you've been doing it, it doesn't feel good to mess up twice and like have to you know get a note like that. Um, and you're not and the so, only person on the set, right? I would imagine this is <laughs> – you have, you have more than I – mean, how many people are around you as you're filming something like this? Oh, a hundred, I'd say. <laughs> yeah, around a hundred. Wow. Yeah. Um, and that's like a standard film crew ish. And, um, and so I, you know, really was staring at that green piece of tape on the floor and knew <laughs> that when we did the next take, I was definitely going to walk in and stand right exactly on that green piece of tape. And that's what I was focused on. And right before they rolled camera, Redford came up to me and just quietly said in my ear, I never hit my marks. (laughs) (laughs) And that's all he said. And he walked away. (laughs) And, uh, I, that would, that was so important because on the one hand, yes, it's, you know, here's this Oscar winning cinematographer who set up the shot and, you know, if the actor's not on the mark, the shot won't look the way that he wants it to look. But I think uh, I think Mr. Redford had uh, you know a lot of wisdom there to know that no matter how good the shot looks, if your actor is focused on a green piece of tape on the floor, it's not <laughs> going to really be worth watching. And, oh, that's a great story. That is a great story, and I suppose <laughs> that's that's also 
part of the gift that someone like Redford brings to the table is that he has so much experience in the shoes of actor. Yeah. That, that he's- well, I, it, he was the first actor director that I had ever worked for. And I really loved that. And that's a perfect example of why, because of just what you're getting at that he could say with authority, I never hit my marks, which I'm sure he's exaggerating. I'm sure he does hit his marks, but he just, he needed to, you know, correct my head there for a sec. <laughs> Any other any other directors come to mind who uh, have have lent memorable experiences to your uh, to your memory banks? I mean, uh, yeah, sure. There's tons. I'm trying to think of uh, of a really good example. I mean, you know, th- this might sound like I'm name dropping, but watching Steven Spielberg set up a shot is pretty special. Um, I remember asking him about shot listing. Uh, shot listing is um, sort of a standard thing that a director does. It's just you write down kind of all the different shots that you want to get for a scene because in any given scene you might have, you know, you might want to capture it from three angles, four angles, five angles, depending on how you like to do it. Um, so I asked him, and, and this is actually uh, in 2011 when I was shooting uh, for him in a movie called Lincoln, which was just the year before I got to direct a movie. So I was really thinking about it. I've always, ever since I was young, kind of followed directors and tried to soak up what I can. But uh, at that time, I was really, really thinking about directing soon. And I asked him uh, if he shot listed. And he showed me in his script a couple of like, tiny little lines that were just no one would have I mean a shot list when I shot my movie a shot list is like was a long document with lots of description about all the different shots that we did for every scene he had like a couple of pencil marks in in his script because he just I I figured that uh, he would be a meticulous shot lister as well because his shots are so well composed um and he 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 doesn't really at least he didn't on lincoln and why is that yeah why is that why why the why the difference i think because he's just got such facility that he would prefer and this gets back to the original point of spontaneity versus planning he would prefer to watch what the actors do and figure out how he wanted to shoot it based on that rather than have the actors have to fit into a pre-planned sort of shot list. And that's what he would do. And when we would, we would show up to rehearsal, he wouldn't be thinking about camera yet. Um, some directors do. He wouldn't. Um, do you think he had just, um, uh, out of curiosity, if you had to speculate, do you think he had shot lists earlier in his career in the sense that, was he was he someone who learned the rules and followed the rules for a period of time until he was so expert at following the rules that he realized he could abandon some of them? Or do you think he's operated that way from the beginning? And I, I raise it in part because I recently watched a documentary, and I think it's simply titled Spielberg, about his life. And it's a fantastic uh, HBO documentary. I, I enjoyed it, at least. It painted a very human picture of him, including his frailties and weaknesses and failures and how he's contended with them. But do you think that he's always operated that way or that he later only having become this virtuoso with confidence, uh, then abandoned the shot list? I would guess the former. I, I can't confirm that. And I never quite asked him that, but I would guess that when he was shooting jaws or when he was shooting Raiders, the lost Ark, that he had some shot lists. That would be my guess. <laughs> Although he was famous for a while for going wildly over budget. So, yeah, for, true. so who knows? But, well, uh, and you know, the story about the shark fin, that's sort of a, that's an old, why don't you, known story? Why don't you tell the story? Because okay. it's, it's so good. <laughs> for, yeah. Okay. For, for those, those of you out there who like my wife don't know the lore of movies. Um, if you've ever seen jaws, which is one of the most powerful movies ever, um, it's about a shark <laughs> and, uh, you never see the shark you, but you see its fin sticking out of the water and, um, 
the story goes, and I, I never asked him about this because I'm sure he's sick of talking about it, but the story goes that they had planned to um, see the shark a lot in the movie, and they had built this big animatronic shark, and they had, you know... Nicknamed the Bruce. Was, <laughs> I didn't know that detail. That's funny. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it didn't work. They got on set, and like, you know, like anything technical, it fucked up. <laughs> Um, right when you needed it to work. <laughs> and, uh, and so his solution was, okay, well, we can't see the shark. Let's just, can we, can we make it work so that we can see its fin sticking out of the water? And, um, if you see the movie, it's so effective. The shark is so much scarier because you never see it. You just see this fin and it's so ominous and, they didn't know that that was going to happen. So that, that speaks to the the point you brought up again, spontaneity versus pre-planning. That's, that's exactly being a film director. You're, you're on a set days of production are so expensive, you know, and, and directing a movie is like a two year process wherein you're actually shooting for like two months of it, mm -hmm. but you're spending, I don't know what the actual number is, but some huge, percentage of your budget is going into this very small sliver of time. And so you're always on the clock and you've planned everything, but then something else will happen. Either something will fuck up or some new great idea will emerge all of a sudden. And it's up to you to decide at that moment on the clock, should I stick to the plan or should I go with this new thing that just came up? And, uh, the ones who can kind of make that decision well, in my experience, are the best directors. So I have, I have a number of follow-up questions, uh, but I'll also just mention something that I stuck in my mind from a director, even though I've never been directed per se, uh, as you have. I mentioned Robert Rodriguez, and uh, he was in... It's been in the last two of my books, in fact, both Tools of Titans and Tribe of Mentorism was on this podcast. That's when I first met him in person was to have him on this podcast. And he said to me at one point, uh, something along the lines of the following, and uh, you've met Robert, so you can imagine him saying this with this gigantic smile on his face, because he always seems to have a big, gigantic smile on his face. He has a lot of fun. And he's a big dude, so it's an especially big smile. <laughs> He's like the Tony Robbins uh, of filmmaking. Uh, he's always <laughs> optimistic. It, I shouldn't say always, but in my experience with him, he's a very upbeat dude. And uh, he said, you know, I have these young filmmakers come to me all the time and they say, yeah, you know, I w ran this project. I was working on this thing, but the lighting didn't work. And then the, you know, the grip fucked this thing up and then this and this and this. And he said, the point I always make is like, that's your job is that nothing is going to work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, that's well put. They, like they don't understand that the job description of filmmaker is like nothing is going to work. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. If, if everything worked, the director would just be able to show up and say action and cut kind of like, right. <laughs> because you should like, if everything was done properly, then the actors will have rehearsed and kind of know what they're going to do. And every, you know, everything should be shot listed and prepared and, I mean, of course, everyone has their own methods, but um, the truth is that a director does do a lot more than action and cut. And I think it comes back to the same thing that we're, we're talking about is like because on the day, things always arise that you don't expect. And you're really there has to be one person who's making those decisions because uh, it would take too long if, if those decisions were made by, by committee. Right. Yeah. Too expensive. You can't afford the delays. Yeah. And uh on the Jaws uh, point, in addition to the fin, for those people who have seen or want to see it, there there are these open water scenes, which, by the way, much, much more complex than Spielberg expected to film. <laughs> and so the, even the fin uh, was uh, difficult to use, and they didn't want to overuse it. So they came up with, on the spot, the idea of using these barrels to track the shark. And uh, for those of you who want to check it out, you can revisit that. But it was absolutely <laughs> uh, an example of the improvising that, that you mentioned, the, the ability to improvise. How did you learn to direct? Now, 
putting putting aside, if possible, the fact that you had been directed so much. So you've been absorbing through osmosis, perhaps, quite a bit, given your career. But when you knew that on the horizon, you're going to be directing your own film, uh, how did you go about learning more about directing the craft, maybe the technical side, whatever it is that you felt you needed to know? What was your approach to learning how to do that? Well, yeah, first of all, I just had the advantage of being on a set a lot and watching a lot of directors on a set. Um, so that part kind of came naturally. Um, but there's a lot more to directing than the time on the set. I think the other one other thing that I came to focus on, though, um, was editing. Because mm-hmm. um, as an actor, you never get to be in the editing room. You're not really aware of that whole process. And it's a huge, huge part of what makes a movie. And, um, I love editing. I remember when I was growing up, I always wanted to edit, but you, you couldn't yet. That wasn't available to consumers yet. Sounds hard to believe now because you can, you know, edit video on your phone nowadays. But when I was, you know, first starting to, you know, make fun little videos with my buddies when I was 10 or whatever. And we were using our family video camera, which, you know, weighed more than 50 (laughs) iPhones all duct taped together. Um, uh, editing was sort of a Holy grail, um, because we would try something and be like, Oh wait, I wish we could do it again, but you kind of can't do it again unless you can edit. Um, and you kind of could, if you set it up, it was a real pain in the ass. If you tried to like dub, uh, what you had shot on the video camera onto an old VHS VCR and, you know, hit the pause button at just the right moment and then find the next thing and dub again. And hopefully the cut was sort of smooth and, but it never was. And, um, anyway, when, when editing finally became something you could just do on a computer at home, uh, I was thrilled and, for my 21st birthday, I got myself a new computer and my first copy of Final Cut Pro. And uh, this is like 2002. And um, I mean, I ended up dropping out of college because I was just so fascinated with sitting there and editing. And Okay, so just, uh, just for sorry, people... Sorry, I skipped ahead. No, no, bit, no, <laughs> we're not skipping ahead. We're jumping all over to the right places. So just for people who uh, don't have this context, maybe we should revisit this. So you went from show business, so to speak, back to school, and then the... So this was one of the catalyzing events then for leaving school, was getting this Final Cut Pro? It was 100% the catalyzing <laughs> event, because I, I would be sitting there at night and I was supposed to be writing a paper for college and all I wanted to do was edit. And I was like, I think I have to drop out of school. <laughs> and then I did. <laughs> <laughs> all right. You know, there's, there's no set script for this conversation. So let's, let's talk about that for a second. We can come back to directing because I, I, I want to certainly talk more about your own experience with your film. Yeah. But why did you, of all things, why go back to school? Why did you decide, place us in time? Like, where were you? What were you doing when you decided to go back to school? And why? Because a lot of folks are thinking of you, your name, impressive career. Why do that? What was uh, what was the scene? If you can set us up with a a description of where you were in life and how you made that decision? Uh, Well, I I mean, I've been um, acting since I was six years old, and was lucky enough to do it pretty consistently throughout my childhood and adolescence. Is it true, um, just as a quick side note, because I've, I've yeah. been drinking green tea since we started, so now I have more personality. <laughs> is it true that you used to blow out your birthday candles wishing for gigs or something like that? Is Am I making that up? Am I hallucinating? Is that No, that's that's something in a magazine that's true. <laughs> Great. <laughs> There's a lot in the magazines that, that, that may not be true. Okay, cool. So I didn't mean to, to interrupt, though. So, yes, you've been, you, you'd had this long career already, right? Starting at age six. And, uh, please, yeah, please and continue. um, well, I'd always wanted to go to college. Um, you know, my, my dad actually dropped out of college, but my mom really, uh, 
spoke very highly of university and, and, and even got her master's. Um, and, uh, I was just always really looking forward to that. I'd always liked school. I was always sort of studious. I liked learning, um, and always frankly found elementary school, junior high, high school, a little, um, uh, lacking, uh, in, in what I was really wanting. I, and I was hoping that once I got to college, then I would like be in these classes that were just blowing my mind all the time. And, um, so, uh, yeah. And, and I think also besides, besides the academics, um, I wanted to not know my future. Uh, mm. I, I always had. Right. And I never, and, I, that makes perfect sense. Uh, I, I, you know, was around all my friends who were, you know, some of them were going to college, some of them weren't, but they all were, you know, finishing high school and starting off on life and like figuring out what they wanted to do or what they wanted to be. And, and I felt like, wait, I shouldn't, I, I shouldn't just let my six year old self make the decision for me of what I'm going to be for my whole life. I should. I should be also making that decision, not just six year old me. And, uh, and so I thought it'd be, it'd be right to quit acting for a while and just go to school. And, um, that's what I did. I, I and I think is, um, one of the, one of the better decisions I've ever made, um, both to, to quit for a while and also to move away from home. Um, you know, not everybody, uh, can afford to move away from home. But luckily I, I was able to, and, um, living in a new city while on the one hand, really challenging, uh, is a huge growth spurt just for who you are and what you think and what you know. And, um, I loved moving away. Where, were, where were you moving from and where did you move to? I grew up in the San Fernando Valley, uh, Sherman Oaks, uh, which is a suburb in LA, although all of LA is sort of a suburb because it doesn't have a center <laughs> like a, a conventional city. But, um, but this is really the suburbs. And, uh, and I moved to New York city, like Manhattan, <laughs> um, Columbia university is where I went. And, um, oh, I mean, I still miss New York. I don't live there anymore, but New York city is just incredible walking around, you know, in, in LA, you don't walk so much. Um, you mostly drive places. And, uh, my favorite thing, still my favorite thing to do in New York is not any particular restaurant or bar or site or anything. It's just walk out your door wherever you are and walk and see what you see and see who you see. And, I, I get so much, uh, inspiration from doing that whenever I go to that city. It is an amazing city. Now you ultimately, as you mentioned not too long ago, found final cut <laughs> and that was the end of school. Uh, what did you choose to major in and why? And w besides moving away from home, why did you find it to be a valuable experience? Well, um, I was about halfway through a bachelor's when I decided to drop out. So choosing a major was looming, but I, I, I never that. actually had to do it. Um, but I was, uh, it would have been a French major because, uh, by that time I was taking my classes in French cause I, I frankly, and this isn't any sort of slight to Columbia university where I went, I just found myself, I think, underwhelmed in the academic setting, um, I, there were some classes that really interested me, but one thing I really, that really bothered me was, um, you were supposed to read so much that there was no way you could read it thoroughly. Right. And, uh, I felt like, uh, I felt like that's what I had been trying to get away from high school where you're having to like prove to someone that you read something and it's kind of condescending and not, not very enriching. And I thought college was going to be something more than that. But, um, and maybe it would have been if I were using it right, or maybe it would have been if I had stuck around, um, and, uh, you know, declared a major. <laughs> but, um, but what I really did like was studying in French because then no matter what, 
I was learning. Just sitting in the class and listening to the teacher speak French or trying to read something in French, kind of no matter what the subject matter, no matter what the paper was supposed to be on or what the test was or anything, just the fact that it was in another language meant I was learning. And um, I had always wanted to speak another language. I felt I felt sort of uh, inferior for not speaking more than one language. And, uh, and I got to the point where I, I mean, I, I wouldn't say that I'm like a fluent French speaker, like someone who lives there, but, um, you know, I can have a conversation with someone in French. I can read the newspaper slowly. And, and it really taught me a lot about even, uh, about English or just about, and about language to, to kind of have more than one in my head. Why did you choose French? Uh, just cause I think mostly cause I liked French movies. <laughs> That's a perfect, <laughs> perfectly good reason. Of, an aesthetic thing. And my, my mom studied French, so I'd, I'd always kind of had that in the air, a sort of a Francophilia. And um, she lived in France for a number of years and, and you know, spoke about it really romantically. And uh, that's one of my favorite moments in life is like walking through Paris with my mom and her being like, this is where I worked when I was younger than you are now. And um, I loved it here. There, there was a real completion there to, to getting to do that with her. Um, nowadays, I, if, if, you know, I, there's probably other languages that would be much more practical to learn, but, um, and not just nowadays back then too, <laughs> but, um, uh, but yeah, aesthetically, I just always found it really appealing and, um, I liked it. I think with language, not to, not to interject, uh, or add, add too much of my, my own thoughts here, but, Languages can, <laughs> languages can be very challenging. And I deeply feel that if you, as a native speaker, say of English, want to learn a language, that you should, it, unless you need to absolutely get a job that requires another language. For instance, if you are uh, a ethnic Indian living in Dubai and you need to speak English to work in the hospitality industries in some capacity focus on English. Otherwise, I would suggest you follow your interest. In this case, yours was spurred by uh, exposure to French films because it's going to be, there are going to be challenging times and uh, there are going to be uh, difficulties along the road and you want to have the enthusiasm and the passion that you feel for not just the language but the culture to help you get over those hurdles and uh, i remember very clearly when i was just starting as an east asian studies major in college to take chinese i'd been taking japanese and i just started chinese and there were 60 kids in the class within two weeks there were 12 kids in the class (laughs) because the pronunciation and so on is so alien and so strenuous, so stressful, I should say more accurately, that it it weeds out a lot of people who are, say, just there to develop a, a, a toolkit for a prospective career that may or may not even materialize later. Right. It's the right. people who are obsessed with something really odd, like the I Ching, or obsessed with calligraphy, or some weird... At, not there are so amazing weird. Chinese movies. Oh, and there are amazing Chinese movies. This is very, very true. Uh, but, but I don't want to take us down too far a rabbit <laughs> hole on the, the Chinese and so on. I want to come back to the, uh, the question of directing, or the topic of directing your own movies. You've, you've directed quite a number. You mentioned when you were working with Spielberg... I suppose it was maybe a year later or a year and a half later, you're going to be directing your own film. Which film was that? Uh, That movie's called Don John. So Don John, you, as as I understand it, wrote, directed, and starred in Don John. How did that, what's the creation story? Why did you choose to make this movie, to write, direct, and star in it, and maybe you could give an, just a, a synopsis of the, uh, not necessarily a synopsis, but a, a sentence or two or three or four or five, however many you like on the, uh, the subject matter. Yeah. Um, well, Don John's, uh, a, a sort of a off take on the old Don Juan story. Who's a, you know, a mythical womanizer. Um, and it's about a guy who's addicted to pornography. Um, and who I think more than 
just being addicted to pornography sort of objectifies everything in his life, not only women, but uh, his friends, his family, his own body, uh, his car, his God. Uh, he treats everything as sort of an object much the same way as he treats um, the women that he jerks off to when he's watching porn <laughs> um, and uh, and has to sort of have a self-realization about that. I mean, it's sort of a coming-of-age story. A coming-of-age story. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> um, and uh, why? Why did I want to tell that story? Um, well, it's it's in many – it's in certain ways a story about media – which, uh, is something that I've focused on my whole life. And, uh, like I was saying a story about, um, how people objectify other people. And I guess without, without trying to sound, uh, like I'm complaining, I have felt kind of objectified myself, um, throughout my life. Um, because, uh, of, of being in the media. Sure. And, uh, and, and besides that sort of feeling uncomfortable for me, and there were times in my life when it felt really uncomfortable, I had, I mean, I, I had real anxiety about it when I was younger and I've, I've gotten more comfortable with it now. But, um, besides that, I also think that, uh, it's not really good for the objectifier either to, for, for people out there who watch these faces on screens, uh, and, and see them as these, I don't know, almost deified, uh, special, uh, entities that are, you know, more important or more attractive or, you know, more, um, worthy of celebration than the watcher. Um, I, I think that's uh, uh, a really prominent idea in our culture and one that deserves to be attacked and made fun of. <laughs> and uh, and so that's what, that's what the movie is sort of about. What what was hardest about making that movie or getting it distributed? It could be anything. What were what were some of the hardest aspects of that, if any, come to mind? Yeah. Well. Writing's really hard. Um, it's super fun. I love writing, but it's hard. Um, I think partially because it's it's more of a a loner sport. Um, at least uh, that one was for me. I wrote it myself, and and I had a great time doing it. Um, but I think probably if you ask what's the hardest part, it's those moments where you know I'll be sitting there having spent who knows how many hours on this over the last X years trying to make this script something that I think is good and hearing a voice in my head saying, this has all been a waste of time. <laughs> you should probably just stop now. And that kind of thing. That's kind um, of the story of my life right there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and, um, cause uh, there, there's, there's no one you can really turn to, to, to fight that voice. You have to just, in those moments, you just kind of have to ignore it and, uh, you know, or if the voice is really getting the better you, I found, I would just have to be like, okay, uh, I'm gonna have to stop for now. I'll mm -hmm. come back to this later. Were there um, any books or resources or screenplays that you found particularly, helpful or motivating in the process of, of writing this? I never read a book about screenwriting. I know they're out there. Um, I've glanced at some, I, I skimmed through one recently, um, uh, called save the cat, which yeah. was, um, I thought smart in, in a lot of ways. Um, but also with all due respect to the smart guy who wrote it, sort of cynical and, and off-putting in, in times. Um, and, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I don't want to say that I don't recommend people read those books cause there are probably some really good, um, good thoughts in, in those screenwriting books that sort of talk about conventional structure and the three acts and things like that. 
I, I sort of, um, I guess got to take in a way a shortcut in a way a long cut because, um, I've just been around it and I've read so many scripts over the years. I mean, my mom was reading me scripts before I could read and, uh, it's a good, good good advantage. (laughs) Yeah. So I have had a certain osmosis, I guess. And look, I, I probably learned as much from the bad scripts as from the good scripts. Uh, and I've certainly read way more bad scripts than good scripts. <laughs> um, and uh, and I also have, you know, uh, for me, writing is a lot like acting. Um, when you're when you're acting, you spend a lot of time with your script, and so I can, you know, when I'm writing a scene, uh, I'm treating it much like I do when I'm preparing to act in that scene and Mm -hmm. and then i can read it and be like "Mm, no that doesn't feel good and i've had you know so many experiences as an actor where you're sitting there with a scene and being like i just wish that this line was phrased a little differently and when you're the writer you can just rewrite it which is nice Um, yeah absolutely and, and, and depending on the director you're working with sometimes you can come in and say you know, Hey, uh, can I say this a little bit differently? And, um, that goes back to what we were saying about a director before that's, that's exactly one of those moments where a director has to go, huh, we've been sitting with that line that way for all this time. And now I have to tell the actor yes or no. Um, yes, you can change it or no, don't. Um, and there's, you know, ways to approach that. You can, you can always say, let's try it both ways. Or sometimes, uh, I found Usually the actors were right. Um, and uh, the dialogue that I wrote was much improved by the actors in Don John, Scarlett Johansson and Julianne Moore and, uh, and, and other ones, too, who who said lines that were ultimately, you know, sometimes subtly different, sometimes quite a bit different um, than what I wrote. And, and I think really benefited. So, Joe, you mentioned being objectified, having experienced being objectified. And this, this leads me to want to ask a question about fame in general, because I have many listeners, many readers who say are on Instagram or on fill in the blank, social network, Snapchat, whatever it might be. And their very explicit goal is to be as famous as possible, to have as as many followers, among other things. There are different indicators that they would use to determine whether they are famous enough or not. But that is a real explicit goal uh, for a lot of folks. Could you maybe share what you would say to someone who is currently uh, holding in mind being famous as a goal? (laughs) Yeah, um... This is something I think about a lot Um, because I guess I've experienced it to some degree. Um, And uh, being famous, (laughs) I would say so. (laughs) (laughs) Well, from what I've seen and experienced, um, fame doesn't necessarily make you happy. Um, And I think the assumption on, on the part of the people you're describing is that if they get a certain amount famous, then they'll be happy. Right. Cause that's really what we all want is to be happy. Um, depending on how you define the word happiness. But I think that sort of is the definition of happiness in a way is what, what we want to be. Um, and, uh, the people that I know that have whatever amount of fame, some of them are happy. Some of them are not happy. Um, and the fame isn't what makes them happy. Uh, you know, what makes somebody happy, I think is, um, you know, do you have your health? Do you have good people around you? Do you get to do things that you like doing? And, and that's where it gets complicated because sometimes, um, having a certain amount of fame does allow you to do the things that you want to do. Um, so it's not a simple answer. And, um, and there are trade-offs also, right? It's not like you just get the upside when you have a lot of public exposure. I mean, I know even in my tiny 
fake famous 14 minutes into my 15 minutes of fame capacity. I've had to sell houses before because like a crazy person has gotten a hold of the address and shown up, <laughs> certainly yeah. without any announcement. And there's been a sort of perceived level of threat associated with that. Uh, and, and that isn't one one hundredth of what you've experienced. Uh, so there are sort of commensurate with your degree of fame, very real trade-offs. Yeah, for sure. There, there are real life trade-offs like that. Um, although I would say the, the thing that's, that's much more impactful isn't, um, real life invasion of privacy in your physical space. It's more an invasion into your, uh, mental, <laughs> to your mental space, into your, your own identity. And, and I don't think this is just restricted to, um, being famous. And especially now that the lines have been blurred so much between, uh, who's famous and who's not famous. It used to be much more clear cut but nowadays you can be, like you said, on Instagram with a certain number of followers and you can, you know, have fame is much more of a spectrum now. And, right. and I think, um, it can be really toxic, um, because what it, because it's really addictive, I think. Um, and, uh, and I think there's a reason for it. I don't, I don't think it's like evil or something. Um, you know, if you go back, I like to think of things in terms of um, how it evolved. And uh, I like to think of early humans, like, you know, like at the beginning of 2001 or something. Um, and if you go back to early, early human-like creatures out on the savannah trying to survive, it probably was an advantage if everyone in your tribe or your pack or whatever you want to call it knew you probably meant that you were more likely to survive and pass on your genes. And so right. I think there is something biological in us that wants that attention. And, uh, and so it's, it's not evil if you feel that urge. Um, I think it's pretty natural, but I think that urge now in the context of modern civilization can be, can be really addictive and sort of poisonous because what happens is you start uh, seeing yourself through the eyes of others more and more of the time and you start, and, and I think social media is, is really like created a giant leap forward in this direction. Um, and it's the kind of thing that used to be reserved for very famous people who are maybe stalked by paparazzi or whatever, but now everybody's their own paparazzi. And, uh, and so I, I, I feel like I see it a lot where, um, you know, the, um, there's, there's a good word to describe it, which I learned recently, um, uh, which is intrinsic versus extrinsic. If you're intrinsically motivated, it means that, uh, your motivation for whatever it might be is kind of coming from within yourself versus being extrinsically motivated is when your motivation is coming from without, from, from other people, from wanting to do things because of how other people will perceive it. And, um, and I think that's a recipe for unhappiness. Usually not absolutely. This isn't a case of black or white and, and there's plenty of virtue to wanting to do things that will make other people happy, et cetera. Um, but, uh, but when it really gets that deep inside your head where your whole identity is sort of, a, a becomes a performance, um, I think that that can be, uh, un, unhealthy or it, it can really, it can really do a number on your head and, uh, I've seen it. Um, and I've, I've spent my whole life kind of trying to avoid that sometimes probably overzealously. And, and I've, I'm, I'm sometimes kind of over protective or, or overly allergic to the trappings of fame, et cetera. Um, but I'm so, I think, scared of, uh, falling down that rabbit hole of becoming overly extrinsically motivated that, uh, 
that I, I really try to stay away. And, 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 and especially when it comes to art, which, you know, art and fame have a, are sort of odd bedfellows, but, um, because, you know, if you want to be a musician and you want to be an actor, a lot of people, I imagine the people you're describing who really want to be famous, they want to be famous by becoming actors or becoming musicians or becoming some other kind of artist. And again, it's complicated because on the one hand, it might mean that, oh, well, that's, that, that's means that my, my work is resonating with lots of people and that's not necessarily bad. But if you're only doing it for that, um, I feel like that's kind of hollow. And I personally feel like I can hear it in, in like, or see it in, in someone's performance. I, I, I won't, you know, name any artist in particular, but there are, sometimes I'll see a performance in a movie or like I'll, I'll hear a song and I'll be like, mm, I, I just feel, I feel like they're, they're performing for their, their, their fame, not, not for them, for themselves, for something that's, that's inside of them. Well, you're alluding to something that has always impressed me about you. And you know what? Sorry. I'm, uh, yeah, I no, want to hear what you, but I just want to, I, I want to also add, I think it's important because I just sort of pointed my finger at, at others. I want to say, uh, I'm not entirely innocent of that at all. I, and that's probably why it scares me also is because I've felt it in myself. There's, it's very seductive and, and, uh, and I'm sure I've been guilty of it in moments or in, in big times or, you know, like I, I've been very guilty of it at times, I'm sure, but I really try to keep an eye on it because, um, cause I, I've, I've kind of, I've seen what it, what it can do to other people and even to, to myself. Right. I mean, unabated, unarrested, uninterrupted. If you allow that that I'm not going to say infection, because like you said, there are some very plausible explanations for why we want or crave social acceptance or validation. Uh, but if you apply jet fuel and steroids to it in the form of these uh, technological tools that we now have, now have at our disposal, if all you want is your face to be recognized by 200,000 more people on Instagram or a million and a half more people on Instagram, whatever it might be, it can be very toxic as you noted and what i was what i was leading up to is the observation and this may be incorrect but at least in a few cases it seems to be true that you've taken very deliberate breaks from acting from your your career in entertainment let's call it and that goes back to your break for school uh, yeah. where where you didn't want to in an unquestioning way, continue on a path that you were put on at age six, right? So there was a deliberate pattern interrupt. And then uh, later, you took a bunch of time off when you had kids. And it's, I would imagine that in entertainment, uh, perhaps like in technology and the world of startups and venture capital and so on, there's a, there has to be, and I want you to poke holes in this if it's not true, but there has to be a, a degree of fear of missing out in the industries that are associated, right? There, there is a, there must be people who continue to take whatever jobs they can get because they have a fear of becoming irrelevant that if they step outside of that slipstream, that no one will remember them X number of years or X number of months later. Uh, so they, they make compromises. And uh, I'd love to hear, uh, you could talk about any, any number of them, but how have you decided, what has been the self-talk and the thinking as you decide to take breaks? Yeah. Um, well, certainly you're right. The, the FOMO is real. Uh, and it's not just a fear, um, because I think maybe even more in show business than maybe any other industry in a certain way. It's, it's, uh, you know, who gets a job as an actor is very, um, very emotionally driven. Um, you know, like studios have some metrics and stuff that they look at and they have their math formulas about, you know, what actors are in what movies that make 
what amounts of money. But compared to, say, what goes on in Silicon Valley, which is really, really data-driven, uh, I'm, by the way, only having <laughs> learned yeah. what that even means fairly recently, but, um, uh, but, it, but it's really emotionally driven who gets hired as an actor. And um, so it's a lot about, uh, you know, quote unquote heat. And um, if you stop, your yeah, your heat's gonna die down. And um, uh, it's a real opportunity cost of taking a break. But um, the two big breaks that you're talking about, uh, one when I quit acting for a while to go to college, and and another recently, uh, I had kids and um, took a lot of time off, and I'm still kind of taking up. Uh, I'm, I'm working a lot less right now than I was before I had kids. Um, uh, of course there's, there's a professional opportunity cost there, but it's, it's a pretty simple comparison. Like, what do I care about more? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I, I, and I don't want to say that. I mean, look, talking about parenting is really, really tough because I have found as, as a parent, um, because, uh, Everybody's got their own life. Everybody's got a unique scenario and everybody makes their choices. And those choices are, they're, they're, they're such high stakes choices, um, that I, I, I feel bad even already just saying what I said, because I don't want to imply that if someone wasn't able to take as much time off as I was, that they were somehow doing a disservice to their kids. I, I don't think that's necessarily true. I, I, I think that's too reductive and, uh, it's not that simple. Everybody's got to do, you know, what they've got to do. Um, that said, I, I, I love having had the chance to work less and spend more time with my kids. Uh, and I do think it's wonderful that there are some countries in the world that, that, uh, you know, afford people maternity leave and even paternity leave. Um, that's a lot less common in, in the U S. Um, and I was just fortunate enough to, have, have made money in my life where I can afford to do it. And, um, have you had people try to talk you out of taking breaks or has that not really been, uh, something you've, you've encountered, you know, uh, or, or, or you commit to taking a break and then you get a call from a manager agent, whoever it might be. And they say, I know you're on break, but <laughs> I've, we've got this one thing and I think it's worth considering. Let's talk about it. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, cause what that makes me think of is, so I, I have a, a long time agent named Warden Zavala who, uh, he, he was actually um, an agent of mine assistant when I quit acting and went to school. And he was the one calling me when I was at school saying, like, I know you're going to school, but um, you might want to consider <laughs> getting back into acting. And uh, and then <laughs> once my heat had died all the way down uh, and in my early 20s and I wanted to get back into acting. And, uh, by the way, I had been known for being on like a TV comedy and stuff and I didn't want to do that anymore. I wanted to do, you know, sort of dramatic and independent films and stuff. And no one really thought that I could do that. And no one really thought that I was going to have much more of a career. I, uh, I thought, you know, I think pretty much all of my agents thought, well, you're that kid that was on that show and that's where it ends. And that's what happens with most kids who are on shows for better or worse. What was the show? Um, what was the show? And oh, we were, I, I was on third rock from the sun from mm -hmm. age 13 to 19. Big show. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and one I'm, I'm very proud of and, you know, remember very fondly, but, uh, 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 uh Warren was the only one really who, who kind of kept calling me and saying like, I, I think you could be good at doing the things that you want to do. Um, and he's still my agent. And, um, he was the one sort of trying to coax me back into acting when I was taking a break for college. But all these years later, when I had kids, uh, he didn't say one thing like that, uh, cause he knows me too well and, um, and we're friends and he wouldn't, you know, he, he had nothing but respect for me taking the time off that I did. And, you know, any agents out there listening, take note. Um, it, it was, uh, <laughs> that is proper, uh, proper etiquette. <laughs> yeah. Really, really, really well done, I think. And which isn't to say that he didn't tell me about the opportunity cost cause he did. That's his job. 
mm-hmm. but when he would tell me about the opportunity costs, he, he wouldn't do it in any kind of passive aggressive way or like, <laughs> you know, threaten me. He, right. would, he would just be telling me the truth. And that's what's so good about him as an agent. He, he really just tells me the, you know, his perception of, of the truth of the business, which is not always kind, but, um, but is the most useful information. When you were at that point at 19, let's just say, and there are many non-believers in uh, your ability to explore these other types of acting and so on, right? And I'm looking at a piece from The Guardian, and uh, feel free to correct this because there are misquotes everywhere about everyone. <laughs> uh, uh, but when, when you were asked what type of acting you would like to do, you wanted to be in a movie that might play at Sundance or something by Quentin Tarantino. And uh, then it comes... That's true. <laughs> yeah, and then it comes to... Uh, if there was a good year or, or if not more being turned away by casting directors. Right. And then this, then the, the quote I want to explore is this, there were moments, days, even of listlessness, you know, wallowing in self rejection and loathing and despair. Uh, that it, it closes with, I also had pretty strong moments of intense optimism, but aside from Warren's belief in you during that period, right. The, the, the one guy who keeps calling, what helps you get through those periods of rejection and self doubt? Are there any 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 tools in the toolkit or a, any particular tips you might give to people who are going through or certainly at some point will go through that type of experience of doubting themselves? That's a great question. Um, well, the first thing is simply just having good people around you. Uh, and I, I had that, but I think the, um, people who love you no matter what, mm-hmm. um, and I'm lucky to have had that. Um, but beyond that, I, I, this goes back to what we were just talking about a minute ago of being intrinsically or extrinsically motivated. Um, I think it's, those are the moments Hey, it's easy to be extrinsically motivated when the world's like just giving you a bunch of thumbs ups. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, um, but, uh, it's in, it's in those moments where you, you really just, it's, it's just you, um, in the darker times or the yeah. moments of rejection. Right. Yeah. I remember, um, what, if I may in- interrupt for a second, what, yeah. what brought up this intrinsic extrinsic motivation, uh, recently or in the last few years? Is that a book that you read that explored that? Uh, was it was it something else? I, I believe Grit by Angela Duckworth is is a book that explores this in some capacity, as it relates to parenting. So how to talk to your kids? Uh, yeah, uh, it might have been that. I think uh, I I think I just heard it from my wife. Honestly, um, mm-hmm. she might have gotten if not that book, uh, she might have gotten it from. She's uh, read a fair amount about child development. Um, So, and, and that is something that we talk about in terms of parenting, um, wanting the kid to be intrinsically motivated. And when you overstimulate a kid, Mm -hmm. it can lead to always chasing that, that sort of, uh, outside approval, um, which then leads to when you're adult, then you, if you can't sort of, uh, find satisfaction in yourself, you're always going to go looking for it elsewhere. And that might take shape in any number of forms, whether it's looking for, uh, you know, ending up in a codependent relationship or an addiction to something or who knows what, um, or something much more subtle than that. But, uh, I, yeah, I think, I think actually you thought of it and, uh, I think it probably was in terms of child development that I, that I learned those words. But I, I did interrupt you. Uh, I apologize for interrupting you. Then I interrupt you. And now I'm going to segue out of my interruption. So you, you were talking about having good people around you as a support yeah. structure and, and anything else that might come to mind. Because you're saying it's, it's easy to be extrinsically oriented when everyone is giving you high fives and like making it rain with money for great gigs. But yeah. uh, on the flip side, it's very punishing and painful to be extrinsically motivated when you're on the the other side. That's that's just it. I I, I remember it was during this same time um, that I was trying to become an actor again and uh, failing. Hmm. I was getting rejected 
a lot. Um, this is right when I started when like really taking seriously editing and making my own stuff. Um, because I, I kind of came to realize, all right, I can't, I can't just wait around for someone to give me a part. It's too painful. I, I have to be able to get the joy that I get through creativity, um, on my own. I can't. And, um, I remember, uh, it was around that time, uh, I made a, a little short film and I submitted it to the Cannes Film Festival. Um, it was in French and I like did it anonymously. I didn't go through my agent or anything. I wanted to see what would happen if I just, uh, didn't like pull any of the strings or use any of the connections I had, um, from having worked in show business before. And, uh, the short film did not get into the con film festival. <laughs> and I was, and I, 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 but I was, I was actually surprised cause I thought it was really good. And, and, uh, and I thought it, I kind of thought it would. And, um, and, uh, a, f a dear friend of mine who's a filmmaker, Ryan Johnson is his name, who, um, I've been in two of his movies, his first movie, Brick, and then his third movie, Looper. And um, he he recently just made um, Star Wars, The Last Jedi. He's a, he's a great, great filmmaker, but also a, a dear friend. And I remember at, at, at that time, having just gotten rejected by the Cannes Film Festival, uh, he recommended that I read Letters to a Young Poet, uh, mm -hmm. Rilke, Rainer, Rainer Rilke, sort of a, I think, a, a known book. Um, but there's a, there's a passage in there all about solitude and um, I think it gets a lot at what we've been talking about in terms of being intrinsically motivated, which is so important when, especially I think if you're going to be an artist, uh, although maybe no matter what you do. And uh, it's all about how you have to just go into yourself and do your very, very best to let everything outside of that fade away and, and find what's really, really going on in just your own, whatever you want to call it, your own psyche, your own self, your own whatever. And, uh, I, I think in terms of the kind of dark moments you're talking about where you're facing that kind of rejection where the world is telling you you're not going to do what you want to do or we don't want you. Um, what really worked for me was just kind of ignoring that and, and finding, um, finding motivation to want to keep making things not for them. And taking not the power into your own hands to do... Yeah to create yeah right start to finish which i think we're going to spend a lot of time on <laughs> we are going to spend uh, uh quite a bit of time on and I'm, I'm not sure if this is a timing connection i'd love to ask you uh so if so you mentioned looper which uh, i'm looking at your filmography i believe was 2012 yep and, shot it in 2011 it came out in 2012 right you were a busy, busy, busy boy in 2012. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dark Knight Rises, Premium Rush, Looper, Lincoln, lots going on. Now, I was looking at a GQ piece that came out August 2012, and I'm, I'm, I've only read this name, so I'm probably going to butcher it. Is it Zoe Deschanel? Is that how you say the name? Yeah, Zoe. Perfect. So Zoe said... That when the two of you did 500 Days of Summer together, eight years after first working together, you were lighter and less burdened. Uh, she said that you changed a lot. Why do you think she said that? And what contributed to the change? <laughs> That's funny. Uh, well, I think she's comparing it to Zoe and I have done two movies together, 500 Days of Summer. Uh, and then... Um, I guess eight years prior, we did this movie, uh, together called manic. It was a little known, tiny budget, you know, indie drama, um, which was really, really heavy. 
So that might have contributed something to it just that, that we were you <laughs> the know, subject making matter. A movie. Right. <laughs> yeah, we were making a movie about, you know, kids in a psychiatric lockdown facility. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I think I, I probably felt like I had something to prove um, in when when she and I first met, I was 19 and I was I was up against exactly uh, that moment that we were just talking about where I wanted to do, um, a movie that might play at Sundance. Right. And all my agents thought that I was, that I should just sign up for another TV comedy for the next five years and had no, uh, belief that I could do anything other than that. And, um, and the casting directors seemed to agree with them. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I was I, I was really worried, <laughs> I guess, and and feeling feeling insecure about that. When did when did hit record enter the picture, and can you tell us how it came to be? Exactly the same time. Uh huh. All right. So yeah. this, I thought there might be a, a correlation. Yeah. Not saying 100%. it's causative. <laughs> not saying it's causal. But what is hit record, and why? Why did it? Why did it uh, manifest? Well, it was in the midst of those exact uh, times when I was um, wanting to get jobs, uh, trying to get jobs, <laughs> failing to get jobs, and feeling like, fuck, I can't, I can't keep waiting around for someone else to let me be creative. I have to be able to do it on my own. And uh, hit record became this little... Um, like turn of phrase that I would say to myself in those moments, like a, a little wordplay about the record button. Um, you know, hearkening back to the little videos I would make on the family video camera that had, uh, you know, a red circle with R E C over it. And when you hit record, you, you start to do it. And of course it's sort of a play on a hit record. Um, and, uh, and that was just my little, uh, almost kind of personal, um, mantra or something that I had to be the one to do it. I wanted to push the button. I wasn't going to wait to just be an actor and stand in front of the camera. I wanted, you know, to hit record. Um, and, uh, and, and the play on hit record is that, that hit record is an object, but to hit record is an action is doing something. Anyway, these are the kinds of things that I would stay up late at night, um, Musing about um, <laughs> what what what, and, now what what does hit record become? What is yeah? Uh, <laughs> it's changed a lot since then. Well, uh, I mean, I guess I'll I'll just tell the whole long story, right? That's the beauty of, let's a, do of it. a podcast. We, we like have yours. we have no rush. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm always I'm always like telling the short version of this story. No, let's do the long um, version. Yeah. Uh, well, so. I mentioned earlier that uh, right around that time I learned to edit. And so I was finally able to kind of start making things on my own, finished things. And this is like 2004-ish, um, so a little before YouTube. And, um, and I wanted to put the little videos I was starting to make on the internet. And my brother helped me set up a little website called Hit Record. And... Um, you know, we named it after this little mantra that I was saying to myself and it was nothing. It was just a, a page of HTML where you could download a couple of quick times of videos I had made. And, um, and, uh, over the next few years, I would sometimes put a new video on there, things like that. Um, and then, uh, we put a, um, a message board on there, like one of those old PHP message boards for the techies out there. It looks not too dissimilar from popular message boards nowadays, like Reddit or something, but kind of the, the ancestor of that. Um, and anybody could kind of start their own. It was easy if you knew how to do a little code. My brother uh, was a coder. Um, so he helped me uh, put up this message board and we watched as this little community formed on a message board. Um, around at first around these little videos that I was making. But what we noticed that was cool was 
Um, while some people came and posted on the message board just to like talk to me about what I was doing or, or, uh, what I had made. Um, what a lot of people actually wanted to do was make things together, both with each other and with me. And, um, and we saw that when I say we, I mean, my brother and I, and we're like, that's cool. That's, that's really new. That's unlike anything you could have done prior to this new technology. And it's different than, um, than just playing videos on the internet because that's kind of just like TV except on a different screen. But if people were actually making things together through the screen, now you're really kind of like doing something new. And, uh, and we leaned into that. And, and at this time, it, it was nothing but a hobby. We weren't spending any money. We had no intention of making any money. Uh, it was just something we were doing for fun. Spent a lot of time on it. Um, and had a lot of fun. Um, but it grew. Um, and, and then I started thinking and talking with friends of mine about how this sort of collaborative process that was happening within this community on this message board could, is, would there be a way to have that operate on a grander scale? Could we make things that were sort of at a, quality level could we make like a short film that would get into sundance or could we could we make music that we could you know release as a record could we make a book that we published or could we even maybe one day like use this methodology to make a tv show or these are the kinds of things we were wondering and we we set about figuring out how to do it um and we started a company and um you know hired lawyers to figure out the terms of service because, you know, for the intellectual property of it and everything, because we really wanted to maintain the collaborative spirit of, of people, not just sort of submitting a short film and being like, Hey, I'm now posting my short film to your website. Will you try to get it into Sundance for me? But instead having there be a community of people that are working together, um, and saying like, well, I can do this or well, I can do this. And, um, Oh, you wrote something. Well, maybe I'll rewrite it or maybe I'll draw something based on what you wrote. Uh, and then maybe someone else will be like, Oh, I like your drawing. Maybe I'll animate your drawing and seeing what can kind of come out of that. Um, and, uh, and it started working and, uh, and that was in, um, 2010, we launched it and it's, it's grown a lot since then. We did those things. We, we, we made short films that got into, Sundance and we published books and we put out records and we even, we made a TV show that won an Emmy and, um, we've paid artists uh, a couple million dollars now over the years. Um, and, uh, the funny thing actually, I, uh, what comes to mind, uh, speaking to you is, um, because y you really come from the world of, of like, uh, you know, entrepreneurship and, and, and business and, we never treated it that way. I mean, it's, <laughs> it, it, um, it was, it was always more of an art project, even though it, it actually, uh, it's become profitable over the last four years. It, it's, it's paid for itself. I, I bankrolled it at first and then it, it started paying for itself. Um, but I remember people, people years ago would say like, how are you going to build it to scale? And I'd be like, <laughs> oh, I don't know what that means. So I'm going to pretend like I don't care. And, <laughs> and, uh, and it's only now that, that we've sort of accomplished some of the things that we looked, uh, to accomplish. And we're now looking to accomplish even more ambitious things that I've kind of come to realize, oh, you know, uh, if we're going to do more than just like one TV show at a time, if we're going to like make lots of things and involve more and more people and, and really try to set an example for how the internet could be something besides, uh, just a showcase, but actually a, a place where people are productive together. Um, uh, we need to make this thing work as a business <laughs> in addition to an art project. And it, it's something we've, that I'm actually excited about, uh, recently. It's sort of what I've been focusing on is figuring out, uh, not how to, you know, I, I don't want to like change it <laughs> really, but just how to figure out how to, I guess, arrange it and, and, and make it, make it work. And so that it can really grow and, and make it more accessible to more people. And, um, 
that's that's what we've been focused on uh, recently. Well, it seems like you're well on your way. I mean, you've had uh, certainly with the successes on the platform and the collaborative model where you're paying out to various contributors who add their skill sets and so on to given projects. You've attracted the attention of some very big brands who have who have come to the site for help with creative projects. And I, I want to, before I keep traveling on that thread, underscore something that you said, which is this didn't start off as a business. Right? It started off as an art project. And yeah. if even though I, ha- I can put on the business hat and I can run different perspective projects through a business set of filters, my retrospectively, and this is often the only way that you can see things clearly, hindsight being 2020, but my best business decisions, if someone were to look at the things that have turned out financially to deliver the most value to me personally and to the world, uh, quite frankly, uh, they did almost all of them started off with no financial considerations. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I'm not saying that if you need to make rent payments, that that's the best way to figure out how to solve that problem. It isn't. Uh-huh. But if you look at the, for instance, even my involvement in tech and startups, it began with me planning out two years of what would be a real world MBA because I wanted to develop certain skill sets. And I was quite frankly, just fascinated by this new world. I knew very little about that. A friend of mine was very deeply involved with, uh, or the podcast, the podcast began because I was completely burned out after completing this book called the four hour chef, which was an intense, intense project that should have taken three years. It was crammed into a year and a half, uh, very proud of the product. I don't think we sacrificed there, but in order not to sacrifice there, I just had to kill myself effectively yeah. for the entire period of time. And the podcast was something I wanted to experiment with because I enjoyed being on the interviewee side of the table so much on shows like the Joe Rogan uh, Experience and Nerdist and uh, WTF with Mark Marin that I thought it would be a relaxing but productive way to decompress. I would be able to focus on getting better at asking questions while simultaneously doing something that was completely different in some respects from writing a book. Mm -hmm. And no monetization model, no plans to have any type of sponsors, nothing. That's how it started. And I think that the reason people ask me all the time, they're like, do you still want to do the podcast? Are you still having fun? I'm like, yeah, I am actually still having fun. And I think in part, it's because it began with, with that being the sole, one of the sole uh, criterion, really, for continuing it was, am I actually enjoying this? I'm going to commit to doing six episodes, and if I hate it, I'm going to stop. It, it, and in fact, if it just bugs me a little bit, I'm going to stop. <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and lo and behold, I enjoyed it more than I expected, and I kept doing it. So it, th- I think that you're in a great position because this platform born out of passion of yours and uh, the others involved in the very early stages was adopted. You've proven out the model in many respects, which by the way, a lot of the best entrepreneurs I know uh, adopt as their path, whether it's Garrett Camp, co-founder of Uber or others who help get projects to a very, very viable stage before looking for, for instance, any kind of outside funding. Uh, you've, you've, I think, checked off the preliminaries in a very organic way that sets you up potentially now if you want to create something that is not just self-sustaining but say fast growing to then bring in partners or outside funding if 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 desired if that makes sense to really multiply how how large this can become and how quickly it can become that Uh, well that's really really exciting to hear you say that yeah, um, yeah, no, I know. Bl- I believe that. Uh, so I mean, at, th- at this I, point, it, you know yeah. what? I wanted to just jump back one second because what you said reminded me of uh, something that I think sort of ties a lot of what we've been talking about together. And that's um, when I when I first 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 started acting, I was young. I was like six. Right. That very and, very young. <laughs> yeah. And 
my mom asked me if I wanted to do it. Um, I think it's still, you know, I, I had been singing in a choir and was in some like community theater and having grown up in LA, uh, some of the kids that were in my community theater were going on auditions for commercials and shows and stuff. And, and she asked if I wanted to do that. And I said, yeah. And I was really liked it. Um, but there would be moments sometimes, uh, where I'd be like, Oh, I don't feel like going on an audition today or whatever. And she would always say, you really don't have to do this. I, I want to make sure you never feel like you have to is it's, we're, we're only doing this cause, uh, you're enjoying it. I can tell that you really enjoy it. But if at any point you don't want to, you, you should just stop. Um, and she wasn't saying it in any kind of like manipulative way. She, <laughs> I realized that it wasn't I a that wink wink. Like, <laughs> if you want to stop. No, um, uh, she, I think she really wanted to make sure I had that out. And, um, and I eventually did take the out, uh, later in life. Um, but, uh, it gets back to what you were saying of doing something because you really want to do it. And that's that intrinsic motivation as opposed to extrinsic. If it's really, really something you want to do way down there, um, there's, there's kind of no substitute for that. And where, where, how are you thinking about the next few years of, of your life and hit record and all these things? I mean, you have a family now, uh, certainly, uh, in a, in a different place than you were 10 years ago, certainly, uh, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, where, where is hit record going and where are you going? Do you think in the next, in the next few years? Yeah. I mean, look, I, I love, uh, movies and I hope I get to keep working on them and by movies. I mean, <laughs> whether it's movies or TV or whatever, it's all kind of blending together now. Um, I hope I get to keep doing that, um, my whole life, but it's what I would really like to do is try to find a way to ultimately blend, uh, my conventional career in show business with, um, what we're doing on hit record. Uh, and I think that's still a while away before these, those two sides will really, uh, meld together. But, um, but one does kind of feed the other. Certainly whenever I, um, have some success, if I'm in a movie that comes out that does well, hit record, sees a spike in interest, et cetera. And, um, but I, I really, uh, I, I, I love the idea of the media being, uh, something different than, than what it's been. And I think, uh, frankly, uh, you know, maybe 10 years ago or so, or even a little more when, when kind of what's been called web 2.0 or was starting up when YouTube emerged and things like that. I was really optimistic about that. And I think everyone was, um, this is going to change the media. This is going to democratize media. This is going to, you know, um, this is going to make it so that, uh, the media is no longer about celebrity and narcissism and things like that. It's going to be about, uh, you know, substance and, and beauty. And, um, that <laughs> obviously hasn't quite come to pass. I think I was maybe a little over optimistic and I, I don't think that hit record is necessarily like the antidote, the be all and end all, but, but it is, um, it's, it's our, and I, I say our, like, you know, a community now of uh, 600,000 people, but, uh, it's, it's, it's our stab at a, a different way of doing it where, um, where you don't come on and just say, Hey world, look at me, look at me, look at me, look what I'm doing. Look what I made. It's about like, what can we make together? And to me, it really feels like that's, that's the promise of, of the internet as a whole is people connecting to be productive together not just to kind of like be endlessly entertained and fed ads. And, um, I, that's what, you know, I, I hope to try to foster. Well, I find hit record fascinating. Also, people can check it out. Hitrecord.org If that's the best, 
uh, URL to use, but in part because you can peek under the hood and see how different types of projects are made and the constituent parts and the team that is involved. And I'm looking at the site right now. You have the project development slate, right? You have, you have a, a list of projects that are in concept development. Then you have a list of projects that are in advanced development. Then you have a list of projects and funded projects. And people can get a better understanding and education about how creative projects get made from the earliest stages to final product. And it's an opportunity. I, I'm, I'm asked all the time, what type of company should I start uh, from, say, uh, college seniors? And uh, I taught a lecture uh, in high-tech entrepreneurship, which was, a, oddly enough, an electrical engineering course, even not oddly because of the title, but because I have no electrical engineering background whatsoever. But I took this course, ELE 491, with a, an incredible professor named Professor Shao, Z-S-C-H-A-U, and I was invited back to talk to students, and I would I would get asked very often, what type of company should I start? Or uh, even worse, I, I hate to say this, but even worse would be, what are the trends right now? And what industry should I go into? And I'm like, oh God, that's that's setting you up for a lot of pain if that's the <laughs> if that's the only filter you're using. But yeah. uh, it presupposes that people should out of the gate start their own company, and I'm not saying that they should or should not. But also, like, what type of movie should I make? What type of album should I put together? One yeah, same thing happens in movies, for sure. Absolutely. And one of the recommendations that I often make, it's not always the best fit. There are some people you're just like, okay, this is the next Zuckerberg. You know what? Like, you do not need to spend five years at someone else's company <laughs> to learn the ropes. But for a lot of folks, maybe it is worthwhile to spend, uh, in the case of startups, a year or two years at a fast-growing startup so that you see exactly how this puzzle looks when it is put together in the early stages and to really build an education and skill sets and relationships that will then help you when you decide to start your own thing. And I think that hit record is also an opportunity to do that collaboratively where it's like, all right, you think you might want to uh, launch a career as a musician. You think you might want to launch a career as a filmmaker. Well, why not kick the tires by contributing on a product or a project rather in one of those categories uh, before you decide to bet the farm or jump headfirst into one of these things. So I, I think that it, it's really a fascinating opportunity to educate yourself and develop skills and relationships simultaneously, even if you are not aiming to start your own project. If that makes sense, I mean that's well. It's it's funny you say that because actually that's that's one of the things we tell um, people who just join is don't start out by starting your own thing. Find someone else's thing that you like and help them and contribute because mm -hmm. um, uh, there's lots of people on there, talented people who've got their own projects going and they need contributions, whether it's music or a writing project or a film project or a you know a design project. There's you know we we kind of do all kinds of media. Um, but they, they need those contributions to come in and, uh, that's the best way to start getting involved. If you, if you show up on hit record and, and immediately say, um, I'm starting my own project. It's sort of like walking into, you know, a production company as, you know, the first day on the job entry level and saying like, okay, everybody follow me, I'm going to lead, a, you know, this whole company in a project now so it might work sometimes, but, uh, but more often it's, it's better to, like you say, work on other people's stuff first, get, you know, get your feet wet, uh, and, and learn how it goes because the way things get made on hit record is really different than the way things get made in <laughs> anywhere else in the world, sort of, because, um, uh, it's this open collaborative process. It's very different than, I mean, there are similarities and differences to say a conventional movie set, but on a conventional movie set, um, not anyone can just stroll on and offer their ideas, throw in their two cents or, you know, write a scene. <laughs> um, th those doors aren't open. Um, whereas on hit record, anybody can and, and, uh, you know, then there's a, the whole process of finding, okay, well, if anybody can come in and try to make stuff, you need people that 
are going through all the contributions and finding uh, finding the ones that are uh, the most applicable that can that can be useful in in the final production. And there's it's a it's sort of its own beast and and one I've come to really love. Um, but it takes some getting used to for sure. And so uh, I I totally agree. Uh, get started by um, finding someone on there who you admire, you think is is good at what they do, and see what they're up to, and see if you can help them. And uh, this applies to so many different domains also. Uh, it, it makes me think of Y Combinator. And for people who don't know what Y Combinator is, you can think of it as the Harvard meets Navy SEALs of startup incubators. <laughs> uh, that's that's a one way to think about it. The acceptance rate is exceptionally, exceptionally low. And uh, they start off with very short, actually, I should say they filter applications first, then the next round is, at least last I checked, this is constantly evolving. Uh, and Y Combinator has become incredibly, incredibly powerful. Also, a lot of great essays by one of the co-founders, Paul Graham. Paul people, Graham, such yeah, a great writer. Yeah, yeah, if people want to look up uh, one of my favorites, uh, I think it's Manager Schedule versus Maker Schedule, also very helpful for creatives. But uh, one of the questions, and I'll paraphrase, but a, a, a paraphrase version of one of the questions that they very commonly ask, or at least did for a long period of time, was, tell us about something you've made, or something that you've you've made recently. And... Uh, that doesn't have to be from blank slate. And uh, just as you noted in your undergraduate experience, some of the classes might have been super compelling, but a lot of them were very abstract and uh, based on rote memorization and not putting the, the rubber to the road. In my experience, if you want to learn how to do X, go do X. <laughs> and uh, it, particularly if there's a way to do it with minimal risk where you have the opportunity to observe other people who are attempting the same thing. Uh, and for some, that might take the form of, say, going to RISD right, and learning design and having active critiques. And I'm actually sitting uh, on something called Crit Buns, which is literally a, an ass cheek supporter that was the first real product made by Joe Gebbia, co-founder of Airbnb. <laughs> and uh, My ass cheeks uh, need some support. Yeah, Crit Buns. There you go. So Joe, please give me my customary 5%. But uh, where, where I'm going with that is that uh, Hit record and other environments that allow this type of open collaboration. For instance, you know, I'm an advisor to a company called Automatic, M A T T, Automatic. Uh, for those who are wondering how that was named, well, the founder's name is Matt Mullenweg. There you go, insider. Automatic. He has his first name in the company name, but uh, he was one of the, if not considered the lead developer on WordPress. And you can see this type of beautiful collaboration. And you also see, look, in any large community, you're also going to have some strife and the occasional village idiot that's going to happen. But this, this incredible dynamic of organic creation that comes out of an open source project like that, uh, I think you can also see on hit record, but in a very, uh, in some cases, a very visual medium. So in any case, that's just my, my way. And I've, I, I am, I don't have any secret equity stake <laughs> in hit record. <laughs> I just think it's, I think it's a, I think it's a very, very exciting environment and sandbox in which creatives can experiment. Uh, so I, I that's cool you to say, man. Thank you. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, you're at, you said 600,000 or so people, mm -hmm. um, let me know when you, when you hit a million and I'll take a, a short video of me taking a tequila shot and shoot it back over to you. <laughs> <Nice>. uh, <laughs> and I want to be respectful of your time. You have, uh, you have so many different things that you can spend your time on. So I, I really appreciate you taking time to have this conversation. First of all, Oh man, my pleasure. Sincerely. And, uh, are, do you have any, parting words, requests of the audience, anything that you'd like to convey or suggest or ask uh, before we, before we wrap up? Uh, you know, the, the last thing that, that I might say, and, and it, uh, it does connect to a lot of the other things we were saying is, um, just then when you were, when you were talking about how, um, if you want to do X, go and do X. If you want to learn to do something, if you're considering a career, for example, as a musician or as a writer or an animator, maybe a hit record might be a, a cool step. I, I would just talk about the other side of the coin, which is 
without any goal at all, if it just feels good to you, maybe you don't want to be a professional artist of any kind. Um, but I, I think there's, uh, there's a lot of people out there who have that urge to make stuff that don't necessarily want to, you know, dedicate their entire life to it. Um, I think that's equally important. That's sort of a part of creative culture that in, in a certain way, I feel like we're, we lose track of sometimes in, in this world where, you know, Silicon Valley is, is so excited to say to everybody, we're democratizing media and entertainment. And now anybody can be a superstar. Like that's cool. But you know, in, uh, in, in older times, uh, if you wanted to hear music, well, there wasn't a radio and there wasn't a gramophone. If you wanted to hear music, it was going to be because like your uncle happened to, you know, play an instrument or something. And you would hear music because not, not because you were listening to professionals play it or a recording of a professional playing it. You would hear your close people around you, friends, family. That's the, you know, original meaning of folk music. And, and in fact, it's also the original meaning of pop music, popular music, popular meaning people, it's people. And, and I think that's the same, same goes for storytelling or for art of any kind, really. There's, there's something really beautiful about people who aren't necessarily trying to be the next superstar, but who have that, that creativity in them and want to, want to do stuff with it. Um, I think that's also really important to let out of you and you don't have to measure it up against, well, but uh, if I put my uh, song on the internet or my story, is it going to get enough likes or is it my, are they going to think that I suck? Who fucking cares? <laughs> like that's really not, that's not what's going to ultimately make you happy. That ties back to the fame question. Like it's, What's going to make you happy is if you have that urge to do it. And um, that's, that's kind of where Hit Record came from for me. And that, that's what I hope that it can continue to be for most of the people that come uh, aren't necessarily trying to be pros. There are some uh, that are. And, uh, and oftentimes those are the folks that end up leading. Um, but, uh, but most people are just having a good time making stuff together. And, um, and that, I, I never want hit record to lose that. Um, so definitely for what it's worth. I think it's worth a lot. And I'm trying to pay more and more attention to what I would do if I couldn't tell anyone or show anyone. <laughs> what, mm, are, what are mm. those things? Or maybe it's limited to two or three friends who come over on Friday nights to, have a glass of scotch and just say, Hey, what the fuck have you been up to? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> All right. What do I show them? Right. And that's it. That's the limit of the audience. I'm not doing mm -hmm. market testing and that can lead some to some really beautiful places. Uh, so I'm, I'm spending more time thinking about that myself. So I, I appreciate the reminder. Uh, where, where can people say hello if they want to try to say hello on the interwebs on uh if, if you're on the socials if there is anything that you'd like to put out there to the world if people would like to wave a hand or if you, you can leave it at hitrecord.org are there, are there any other uh any other places that you would like to to mention before we put a put a pin in it yeah if you want to make stuff together hit records that that's kind of what it's for um and and i am on on twitter and facebook and instagram um so you can check those out too. All right. I will link to the real accounts in the show notes <laughs> just so you don't have <laughs> just a fan account. I don't want to have people go through 17 of those. So for people listening, as you know, if you're a long-term listener, but if you're not, let me tell you a little bit about how the show works. We will have links to everything, including hitrecord.org, uh, including the books that were mentioned, Letters to a Young Poet, very powerful book that I recommend to everyone. Uh, as a side note, Save the Cat, yeah, which man. I also actually think uh, is, is one of the, uh, despite some of the cynicism and uh, sterility of a, a few <laughs> aspects of it, a, but it is good. A, a, very, smart, a yeah. very helpful book uh, as a starting point when thinking of screenwriting and also calls me on my own 
bullshit, meaning I've been talking about and thinking about screenwriting for so long <laughs> to the extent mm-hmm. that I have fans who are hassling me about it. And thank you for hassling me about it, everybody out there. Uh, so taking a page from this conversation on if you want to learn it, just do it. I think I have to stop reading books. I have to stop oh, yeah, asking sure. people for advice and just actually sit down and stare at that intimidating blank page. <laughs> right. And write a few shorts first. That's exactly that would be my advice. I'm going to get on it. So a few shorts. And uh, Joe, thank you so much again for taking the time. This was a lot of thank fun. Thank you, Tim. And to everybody listening, until next time, thank you for listening. Cheers. Hey, guys. This is Tim again. Just a few more things before you take off. Number one, this is Five Bullet Friday. Do you want to get a short email from me? And would you enjoy getting a short email from me every Friday that provides a little morsel of fun before the weekend? And Five Bullet Friday is a very short email where I share the coolest things I've found or that I've been pondering over the week. That could include favorite new albums that I've discovered. It could include gizmos and gadgets and all sorts of weird shit that I've somehow dug up in the uh, the world of the esoteric as I do. It could include favorite articles that I've read and that I've shared with my close friends, for instance. And it's very short. It's just a little tiny bite of goodness before you head off for the weekend. So if you want to receive that, check it out. Just go to fourhourworkweek.com. That's fourhourworkweek.com, all spelled out, and just drop in your email, and you will get the very next one. And if you sign up, I hope you enjoy it. This episode is brought to you by WordPress.com. I love WordPress. I have used it for so many years. It's my go-to platform for blogging and creating websites. I use WordPress.com for everything, every day. My site, Tim.blog, is built on it. The websites for my books, including Tools of Titans, Tribe of Mentors, it's all on WordPress.com. And the founder, Matt Mullenweg, one of my close friends, has appeared on this show many times. Just search Matt Mullenweg Tequila Ferris for quite an exciting time. Whether you're looking to create a personal blog, a business site, or both, you can make a really big impact right out of the box when you build on WordPress.com. And you'll be in good company. It's used by The New Yorker, Jay-Z, Beyonce, 538, TechCrunch, Ted, CNN, and Time, just to name a handful. And one of my friends at Google, she'll remain nameless, has told me that WordPress.com offers the, quote, best out-of-the-box SEO imaginable, end quote. And it's one of the many reasons that nearly 30% of the internet is run on WordPress. You do not need experience or to hire someone. That's perhaps the best part. WordPress.com guides you through the entire experience. They have hundreds of designs and templates that you can use. And it's easy to get started. There's no need to worry about security, upgrades, hosting, any of that. They offer 24-7 support. And they're very, very responsive. If you have questions, they get right back to you. And this allows you to create the highest quality with the least amount of headache and friction. So if you're building a website, period, when my friends come to me and ask what I use, what I recommend they use, the answer is WordPress.com. So check it out. If you want to get started today, learn more with a 15% discount off any new plan. Go to WordPress.com forward slash Tim to create your website and find the plan that's right for you. To learn more, take a look. WordPress.com forward slash Tim for 15% off a brand new website. Check it out. This episode is brought to you by Four Sigmatic. If you're a longtime listener of the show or brand new to the podcast, my favorite Finnish entrepreneurs who founded this company. Of course, I don't know that many Finnish entrepreneurs, but they may be my favorites, have something new that I've been loving. And some of you are familiar with Four Sigmatic. I've used their products for years now. They were introduced to me by an acrobat of all folks, and they tend to mix different types of medicinal mushrooms into their products. I have recently started using their matcha, which is a green tea, which is designed as a coffee alternative. And if you're trying to cut back on caffeine, as I am these days, the matcha is a great option, and one that I originally learned to love in Japan. has a very smooth texture to it. Their matcha blend, in particular, includes the amino acid L-theanine, which helps to provide a, let's call it, balanced boost of energy without the jitters. It also includes the adaptogen astralagus, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, which may help with overall stress tolerance. And for those of you who are wondering, no, 
the products don't taste like mushrooms. <laughs> if they say mushroom coffee, for instance, another product that I use doesn't taste like mushrooms, it tastes like coffee. But you get the nutritional benefits of some of these special ingredients. So the products don't taste like mushrooms and are enjoyable. I offer them to my house guests and use them myself, and I don't particularly want to drink anything that tastes like mushrooms. So, moving on. The folks at Four Sigmatic have designed a few special deals for you guys, my listeners, which include many of my favorite products of theirs. So check it out. Visit Four Sigmatic, F-O-U-R-S-I-G-M-A-T-I-C dot com forward slash Tim Tim, that's T-I-M-T-I-M, no space, to see these special deals, which are not offered anywhere else. Remember to use the code Tim Tim. I don't know why they chose Tim Tim, but there we go. Remember to use the code Tim Tim at checkout to receive your special discount. Again, that's foursigmatic.com forward slash Tim Tim and enter the promo code Tim Tim. Check it out. <laughs> 